Greetings from Taipei, where I am finishing up my first day of quarantine. Um, and happy second day of Women's History Month. A quick note before we begin, NDI has some really great events and reports and podcasts coming out all month long. So make sure to follow um, the Twitter handles um, for NDI, which is at NDI, as well as our NDI uh, Gender, Women and Democracy team at NDI Women for more information on, on that. Oh no, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, sorry, I just got a notification saying that it was bad. Anyways, I am Maeve whelan Weist, a program manager for NDI's Asia Pacific team, and I am really excited about this opportunity to moderate a discussion with our three fantastic panelists on women's political participation and the strides, opportunities, and also continuing challenges that women in Taiwan, Asia, and the world face in engaging with politics, both in formal and informal capacities. NDI recently produced a series of short documentaries called Faces of Democracy Taiwan, profiling four young women in politics in Taiwan as part of NDI's Changing the Face of Politics campaign. If you haven't watched them yet, please do check them out. Not now, uh, wait till at the end of the event. So for today, each of our panelists will provide some opening remarks and then we'll leave plenty of time for a more free flowing sort of armchair discussion, if you will. But before I turn it over, let me quickly introduce our esteemed guests. I'll keep it short since we're all online anyway right now. So if you wanna learn more information about anybody, you can Google or Bing away. First, we have Ambassador B. Kim Xiao, Taiwan's representative to the United States since July, 2020. No stranger to politics, Ambassador Xiao has served several terms in Taiwan's legislative UN, most recently representing the beautiful county of Hualien. Next, we are joined by Sandra Peppera, director of NDI's Gender, Women, and Democracy team. Sandra and her team drive NDI's global work focused on empowering women to participate, compete, and lead as equal and active partners in democratic change. And then last but not least, we have Lynn Lee, associate director for Asia at the National Endowment for Democracy. In this role, Lynn is a critical steward behind the NED's vast portfolio of programs across the Asia Pacific region, focused on democracy, human rights, and governance. So without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Ambassador Xiao to kick things off. Well, good morning, and thank you, May, for the introduction. And I'm a bit jealous that uh, you are in Taiwan right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, traveling has been complicated with the quarantines, but um, we are so delighted that NDI is opening up office uh, in Taipei um, as a basis for cooperating with the uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, as well as the many uh, vibrant NGOs uh, in Taiwan in uh, promoting democracy in the region. Uh, but today I do want to especially thank NDI for hosting uh, the event and for launching the video series, uh, Faces of Democracy, uh, showcasing the stories of four Taiwanese women leaders uh, in politics. I believe their stories do demonstrate Taiwan's progress in gender equality, as well as inclusion of youth, indigenous communities, and LGBT, um, the LGBT community in Taiwan. Um, NDI has been a champion in promoting gender equality and women's rights, and it's my great pleasure to join this virtual panel discussion to discuss women's political participation in Taiwan. Uh, over the past years, Taiwan has made great advancements in gender equality, and today we rank, um, I think, probably the first or at least a one of the top amongst many indicators in the region. Um, in terms of uh, legal rights in Asia, uh, in a recent World Bank report, we were rated as uh, the top. Uh, in January 2016, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen was elected Taiwan's first female president, and she was reelected again in January 2020. Uh, women legislators currently uh, make up 42% of the seats in the legislative UN, uh, the highest in East Asia. Uh, furthermore, I'm proud to be the first woman representative from Taiwan here in Washington in the United States. 
Today, many women politicians, activists, and NGO leaders are also the driving force behind social progress in Taiwan. Their advocacy and activism in a number of issues, ranging from human rights to the prevention of domestic violence and human trafficking have brought about monumental progress in Taiwan society. And I'm grateful that NDI has decided to feature some of these stories in your video series. And I'm eager to work with NDI to draw even more attention to the work that they are engaged in. Taiwan's progress on gender equality did not take place in a vacuum. In past decades, it took place hand in hand together with our advancements in democracy, freedom, and respect for human rights. For example, during Taiwan's democratization process, a number of women pioneers played important roles in the democracy movement, including our second popularly elected Vice President Annette Liu and head of our National Human Rights Commission Chen Ju. Uh, she, their struggles for political and civil freedoms, together with the resiliency of the countless other women who also participated, demonstrated to many Taiwanese people the essential role women play in bringing about political change. I also want to highlight the courage of these two women uh, who actually were imprisoned uh, for speaking out and for their role in um, political and democratic progress in Taiwan. But as Taiwan democracy matured over the years, we started to see a greater focus on not just democracy, but women's issues, uh, which ranged from the prevention of domestic violence to gender equality in the workplace. In 1998, the Domestic Violence Prevention Act was passed. In 2002, the Act of Gender Equality in Employment was enacted to foster greater equality in the workplace. And in 2004, the Gender Equity Education Act provided for gender equality education in schools and furthered gender equality concepts among our younger generation. Taiwan's free and open society has also facilitated greater interest from young women to participate in politics. With free access to information and diverse views, young women have the space to develop their own views and become active in political and social discourse. As legislator Lai and others pointed out in the video, their interest in politics and social issues started early, either through joining online forum discussions, taking leadership roles in student associations, and participating in social movements or student protests. Taiwan's democracy has fostered greater gender equality, but equally ensuring that all voices are well represented also strengthens our democracy. Our own experiences show us in any healthy democracy, it is essential to have different voices at the table. The experiences, perspectives, and leadership of women should never be missing from any important decision. There is a robust data that shows uh, that would show when women participate on a level playing field, results tend to be better. Countries tend to be more prosperous and societies more resilient. I also want to point out that gender equality includes all sexual orientations as well. I'm proud that 13 years ago, after I first raised this issue in the legislature, Taiwan became the first Asian country to legalize same-sex marriage in 2019. We're also pleased to see several individuals who have championed for LGBTQ rights have now been elected to public office. A few years ago, our first transgender minister was appointed to the cabinet. We hope that these experiences can be a model to, for, to other countries in the region, encouraging them to make progress towards fairer and more equitable societies. And while we note our many advancements in these areas, we know much work remains to be done. At home, we'll continue to prioritize dealing with issues that prevent women from entering the workplace. Just earlier this last month, uh, President Tsai announced that the government will start providing additional subsidies for childcare and early education. She's also increased the number of public childcare facilities and required that large companies provide childcare services in the interest of encouraging more women to join the workforce.
And around the world, Taiwan will continue to be a leading voice for gender equality and inclusion. We know that in many places around the world, women still lag in terms of political participation, representing a quarter of legislative seats globally. Women earn less pay for the same work and face significant social, cultural, and in some cases, religious-based persecution. Taiwan will continue to partner with like-minded countries to address these significant challenges. I wish to again thank NDI for hosting this important video series and for bringing into focus how women continue to shape Taiwan's diverse and democratic political landscape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Xiao. Next, we'll go to Sandra Pepper. Thank you, Maeve, and thank you, Ambassador Xiao, for that um, overview of um, Taiwan's history on gender equality. I think it's really um, very special because at NDI, a number of the points that you raised are actually, um, in a way, baked into our view of gender equality and democratic consolidation. So first, the big picture issue uh, is that um, Taiwan has taken advantage of its political transition to address and transform gender equality and gender relations. I think this is really a uh, key. We, we know it in the research and we sometimes see it, but the really steadfast and dedicated way that Taiwan has moved through this since 1987, uh, I think is, is almost a textbook of what we would like to see happen more often. Um, I think the second point about this is that you've, you've done this and you founded it in law and equal status, equal legal status. I think this is hugely important. Uh, and then thirdly, I would say that you have um, not neglected all the sectors. Uh, I think to the extent uh, that I know about uh, for, for Taiwan in 1998 to, uh, to pass a domestic violence law is um, it's, it's well ahead of a number of countries. And there are still, I think, at least two dozen countries in the world with no domestic violence law whatsoever. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited um, at having heard what you said, and also, uh, if I may, it gives me a better insight to the point you made in your podcast uh, when you talked about the inspiration that you had received from um, from other women it, as you stepped forward into public life. Um, hearing the story of um, the pioneers in Taiwan um, has put that into context. So thank you very much for for that introduction. I was asked, and I'm going to do this very quickly, to try and tie together what's happening in Taiwan on gender equality and democracy to NDI's um, approach. Uh, and I've tried to indicate that even in my first remarks. But I, I watched the films, and they are fabulous films. Anybody who hasn't seen those films should really, really watch them. Um, uh, and what I found, uh, because it helped me to um, organize my thoughts, was a, um, a quotation in each film that really reflected something that I wanted to say about MDI's approach. Uh, and my apologies early, because I'm sure I'm going to massacre these names, but I will try. So, uh, Miao Bo Ya, who said, gender equality and democracy have a relationship. Absolutely. Um, uh, gender equality and women's empowerment for NDI is central to democracy. Famously, um, Madeleine Albright, who was the first um, woman Secretary of State in the United States and is the chair of NDI's board, has said, development without democracy is improbable. Democracy without women is impossible. And that really is, in a way, our slogan and motto around this, because we believe that the equal and active political participation of all members um, helps to build democratic resilience. Uh, and uh, one other thing that um, Miao Boya said in her uh, presentation, uh, she talked about the narrow gap through which Taiwan uh, has um, fit in, in the Asia region and the ability to persevere. Perseverance is resilience. And I think, you know, just even as she described it, she really encapsulated um, uh, what NDI believes happens when the voice and agency of all sectors of society are involved. And of course, in, in this case, the um, rights of the LGBTQI community have been well addressed and well represented, uh, allowing them uh, to use the democratic processes to actually achieve democratic goals. 
that's hugely important because if you don't allow people to use democratic processes what happens they try and find other ways to address their needs and demands so that was um, from Yao Boya um, Tuhi Matuka said that being an indigenous in Taiwan she found herself early on walking in parallel worlds but she's now connecting the two again I think this is really important um, the right of um, her indigenous community to advocate for their own needs and ambitions in their own way reflects NDI's foundational premise that there is no single blueprint for democracy. Rather, we work on the basis of a set of shared universal principles and behaviors. And in uh, Tuhi's um, view, she um, she emphasized respect as something that her community really hung on to. And I think this was also a great illustration of the way in which global norms and coalitions can help to validate and strengthen the voice and agency of local communities as part of the democratic community. NDI um, uh, helps to to shape, consolidate, and inform global democratic norms. And this is really important because then people like Tuhi can draw this down into their local activism. Um, uh, Lai Pin Yu said, my legitimacy as a representative comes from the authorization of my constituency. And again, a very clear link to her role and responsibility as a democratic leader to uh, actually uh, uh, represent her constituents. In South Africa, uh, Lai Pin would be known as part of the born free generation. She tells us that she was born after uh, the ending of martial law. Uh, but she reflects how new voices are changing the face of politics by bringing a different perspective on the past and a new vision for the future. Um, she also uh, represents the practice route for women's political leadership, which is to start in social movements or civil society activism, which is why, again, NDI um, puts so much importance on the, the space for civil society activism. It's absolutely key. As far as gender equality and women's empowerment concerned, this is the main route by which women uh, engage in political um, uh, leadership. And uh, Lai Pim presents an authentic voice, meeting the people where they are through her use of new and different tools of engagement, like cosplay. And then finally, uh, Xu Xiaoxin, said men control the most important confidential part of the national government system uh, and i think this is um, a, a good place to kind of draw my remarks to an end because gender is not just a social construct it determines our political and national security architectures too as ambassador uh, b kim said earlier on the gender political empowerment gap is the single biggest gap of all empowerment gaps. It outstrips finance, education, and health, and stands at 70%. Uh, and this uh, uh, kind of the importance of this has, I think, recently been very well studied and presented uh, in a, um, a new book last year by Professor Valerie Hudson and her co-authors, uh, The First Political Order. And it encapsulated in this she says, what you do to your women, you do to your nation, which again is this idea that gender is in a way the first political um, uh, uh, element of any um, society it starts in the family, but it actually comes through into um, into politics and national security and and Xu Xiaoxin um, use this uh, point to uh, really reflect on the fact that women needed to take equal um, equal responsibility and have equal rights at what she called the hard power of Taiwan in that area of politics and national security. Studies have shown that men who hold women as inferior are much more likely to engage in political violence. They're more likely to be hostile to minorities and to foreigners. So in case anybody's worried, I'm not suggesting that there should be no men in politics. 
but I do absolutely advocate to have a lot fewer of them and let the new voices of women, the young, uh, come through. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sandra. And lastly, we'll turn over to Lynn Lee. Thanks, Maeve, and um, thank you, NDI, for inviting me to speak at this um, lovely event. Um, and it's pleasure to be here to talk about Taiwan's role as a democracy and governance leader. Um, the endowment um, and its engagement with Taiwan goes way back to 19, late 1990s. And um, for the last two decades, we have worked very closely with Taiwanese civil society organizations, think tanks, and academic institutions, and with the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy on a number of regional and global efforts to build regional and um, uh, regional and global efforts to um, defend human rights and democracy. With um, growing democratic challenges around the world, um, the endowment has been particularly interested in engaging democracies in Asia for their partnership and defending shared norms and values. And Taiwan, um, especially for the last several years, has been a critical partner as they're also trying to position themselves as a regional and global leader in human rights and democracy support. And um, today, I just want to talk about three areas that um, that Taiwan has been um, um, setting um, an excellent example in and where we think um, um, Taiwan could continue to expand their roles in. And the first one is, um, is that um, Taiwan can inspire democracy actors around the world by sharing stories about their democratic development. The um, video series produced by NDI and featured at this event, Faces of Taiwan, is a great example of how Taiwan can contribute to bolstering democracy in the region and beyond by telling their democratic story, especially how they're able to emerge from martial law and develop a pluralistic and dynamic democracy, even in the shadow of China. Taiwan has been um, has made strong strides in equality for women, the LGBT community, and the the indigenous communities, as both previous speakers have mentioned, and also uh, featured in the video. Taiwan can also share their experience in terms of social movements among youth and engaging youth in politics and government, which can be especially valuable given the large youth population in countries across the region. There is a much to be learned from how Taiwan transformed itself over the course of the past 30 years, and I think this alone could be a very valuable contribution. The second part um, is that Taiwan can lead an effort to build democratic resilience against foreign authoritarian influence, particularly China. It has, it has the experience of developing its democracy while under the intense pressure from China, and given that so many countries across Asia are dealing with various levels of influence and pressure from China, how has Taiwan been able to withstand it and still develop a such dynamic democracy? I think the answer to that question will be an inspiration for all those struggling with this issue around the world. And some of our efforts looking at the impact of China's influence and in undermining democracy rely on our Taiwanese partners we have years of experience and know-how in monitoring, analyzing, and successfully responding to China's influence and operations in their country. And third, um, I know Ambassador Xiao has uh, heard this uh, before, but we hope that um, the traditional donors of human rights and democracy work will be able to continue to support democracy movements around the world but I think this world work can be much more impactful and meaningful when countries such as Taiwan can step up in funding civil society efforts around the world. TFD has, had, has a grant making component and our partners in Asia are grateful for funding support from TFD. But we believe the ultimate expression of Taiwan's commitment to global democratic movement can be through scaling up and expanding scope of its funding support for civil society organizations fighting for the same freedom and values that the Taiwanese people have had to fight for decades to attain. Taiwan has been an important player in democracy and governance, and um, especially on the front of equality for women, LGBT, indigenous um, rights issues. 
and uh, much more on um, um, countering um, malign influence, um, especially from China. And um, I believe that um, uh, Taiwan has um, the capacity to do more, and we look forward to Taiwan's extended role in this democracy support space. And I'm going to stop here. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. Okay, so now we get to turn to the fun part um, where we get to, I'll ask some questions, but um, everyone feel free if you have a question for someone else or you wanna jump in. It's like I said, it's sort of, you know, picture us on a stage in our fancy armchairs. So let me start um, with a question for, for everyone, for the whole group. Um, you know, in the basis, Spaces of Democracy Taiwan series, um, NDI chose to not only highlight women's stories, but as we've discussed, um, sort of, I think in everybody's remarks, but also women facing intersectional um, challenges and identities. So from the LGBTI, indigenous and youth communities. How does or should the democracy assistance community, as well as government and political institutions, um, how should they continue to support women from these backgrounds, both in Asia and globally? Well, I'll go first. Um, I, I, from our point of view, um, uh, and um, I would say this, wouldn't I? You know, if you support women, as these films show, you brace open the space for every other demographic group. You know, women aren't just 50% of something. They're 50% of every demographic group. They're 50% of youth. They're 50% of ethnic minorities. They're 50% of the indigenous. They're 50% of the old, disabled, and the LGBTQI community. So a focus on women uh, isn't, um, if you like, precious. Actually, it um, does two things, uh, and Maeve, to your point. It deals not only with the numerical representation, but it deals with the um, uh, uh, sectoral and intersectional representation issues too. Um, it's, uh, I, I often quote the fact that the uh, 26, 20, January 2017 Women's March, the first Women's March here in DC in January 2017 was the biggest Women's March, but it was also the biggest disability rights march ever held in the United States. And, and that's what happens when you brace the space open for women you brace the space open for all voices um, that are not traditionally represented, frankly, by old men um, who are generally um, the, uh, the makeup of our political leadership. Okay, um, I'll take the next shot. And um, I, I, I think, you know, women's rights and the um, concept of uh, uh, respect for diversity and inclusion actually go very much hand in hand. And in in our own experience, um, the end of martial law meant, of course, the opening of some space for sp free speech and free organization, association, and uh, free press. And you know, all of that also created room for the various social movements. And so we saw we, we saw this kind of symbiotic relationship between the broader democracy movement um, along with the various uh, sectoral, you know, issue specific social movements. And I, I don't think one can progress without the other. Um, you're not gonna have women's rights when you don't have you know, the general respect for sovereignty to the people uh, um, conceptually when you don't have democracy. And you're not going to have full democracy when uh, women, as well as some um, other um, uh, groups and, and sectors in society are not included in the process. And um, so, so I think that's important to keep in mind as um, institutions like NDI or the TFD and you know, other organizations uh, as we support democracy, we're not just supporting the concept of broader, you know, institutional um, rights um, in terms of, you know, the, 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 those rights that, that are critical to uh, building democratic institutions like, like voting and, um, you know, free speech, but we're also supporting uh, advances in fundamental rights for um, important sectors of society, too. Um, so, so, you know, that is useful in terms of um, pr 
practice, you know, I, I mean, I, I, the first part of my response was more in the conceptual uh, theoretical sense, but in, in practice, I, I have found that um, in, in my own process of, of, you know, building confidence as a, as a woman and building that space for, for um, gender equality in, in my own profession, which has been politics uh, for, for the past two, two decades. And, um, you know, the, the fact that there have been pioneers and that their experiences have been highlighted, you know, has been important as inspiration, um, you know, dem as a demonstration that um, there have been women that have taken this route and uh, life, it, it has been very difficult, but they made it. And it kind of provides some light at the end of the road. I think for other um, others coming at later generations, you know, as we face all kinds of challenges, discrimination, prejudices, you know, we, we see that there have been other, you know, strong women who have made it, uh, who have overcome these these problems. So I think that, you know, um, you know, best practice, you know, sharing of, you know, more, you know, pioneers and those who have come before us is important. But for the next generation, I think it's important to provide that um, networking space as well. And, you know, it's, it's made easier with the modern social communication tools that were not available for my generation uh, as we were initially dealing with these challenges. And so um, I, I think that does open the door for many new perspectives um, so that our issues are not single issues, they are interconnected and they are also advancing at um, you know, equal pace um, in, in terms of coordinating different issues and opening doors to the concept of diversification and inclusion. So if I could just add quickly and follow up on some of the points that um, Ambassador Shao made. Um, so, um, it, and this is something that NDI's Asia team, the Democratic Unity Project could perhaps consider. A conversation I had last night was that in a very advanced democracy in Asia, there was a panel of five and there were all men over 65, but um, the topic had to do with gender equality. So um, that's that's a very, um, you know, in a in a in an age <laughs> where um, equality just seems to be more of a norm, um, that's still not happening in many of the Asian societies, especially in democracies. So um, I, I knew Sandra, you would say that <laughs> it's not just uniquely Asia, but but at the same time. Um, this is an area that we could really look into. How do we empower women, not just the women's rights, and as Ambassador Shao said, um, also like women working in different sectors. So how do we empower them to, to have their voices, not just heard, but represented? Um, so uh, that's, that's one area that we need to do more as a part of our democratic resilience and unity building um, in the region. Sandra, may hand up. Yeah, no, it's a very small point because I, I agree um, and I'm absolutely in, in sync with Ambassador B. Kim and with Lynn. Uh, but just to to again uh, reflect a real positive in one of the um, in one of the videos, uh, there was a comment that uh, in ta uh, Taiwan, the women's civil society um, and rights organizations are um, in, in a strong alliance with the LGBTQI uh, um, uh, associations. Now, this is not common. It doesn't happen everywhere as as um, as positively as it seems to happen uh, in in Taiwan. And and um, you know, we are about to launch another program in different parts of the world, which is to uh, focus on trying to build that uh, coalition and alliance between women's rights organizations, which are usually cis women's rights organizations, and the LGBTQI community. Uh, and so uh, just one more place where um, Taiwan seems to be in the progressive vanguard uh, on these issues. Um, I just wanted to reflect that here. Thank you. So I have a question now for Ambassador Xiao. Um, in your remarks, you discussed sort of the early leaders and policy and legislation that have been critical to paving the way for Taiwan's increased women's political participation. Um, my question for you is, if, 
could you talk about maybe certain inflection points, um, you know, in, in that history where, you know, maybe it could have run one way or the other and sort of why, um, you know, why you think Taiwan was able to sort of move, um, in, you know, towards progress um, and if there are any takeaways for, uh, for other countries in the region? Well, um, you know, when I first started out in politics, um, and that was a while ago, there were not as many women as we see today. So it has been a difficult process. I mean, we celebrate all the accomplishments, including the LGBT rights in Taiwan. But, you know, what a lot of people don't see is the long and painful um, process uh, in which uh, we have uh, come about uh, to where we are today. Um, and I have to say that in initially, um, decades ago, when, you know, the early women in politics, um, at least from those associated with the democracy movement, um, many of them were actually the wives or daughters of political prisoners. And, and um, you know, the, the, these family connections that initially were a strong motivating factor for them to come out to seek justice uh, through a public life and a political participation um, actually got a lot of sympathy and support from society. But I think eventually to expand beyond um, kind of uh, family members participating, we did require additional uh, legal incentives. And so um, constitutionally, we went through some uh, a reform process as well as legislative process. Um, in addition to those laws that, that I mentioned in my o opening remarks um, on, you know, gender equality in the workplace and education and against domestic violence, um, I think one very important legislation that is often um, um, overlooked is the fact that initially we had a reserve seat system uh, that was a minimal guarantee of uh, women um, requiring political parties to nominate um, uh, a certain um, proportion of their candidates uh, by incentivizing uh, the election rate. Uh, in a multiple seat district, uh, it was legally required that at least one out of four of those elected had to be women. And so that encouraged the political parties to go out to find more women candidates. Um, you know, eventually we have way surpassed that threshold, and that is um, the majority of women elected today um, in local government, where we do still have the multiple seat system, are elected in their own right and not because there is a minimum threshold. And so, um, you know, we, we have made progress, but that was kind of the initial you know, transitional point in in really opening that space for um, more women and political parties taking those initiatives to 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 encourage uh, more women to join um, politics. I think a second uh, inflection point would be um, probably the election of uh, women leaders to significant positions of power, including uh, our first democratically elected woman vice president, Annette Liu, and and our first democratically elected president. Um, you know, as we look across Asia, we do see a number of women heads of state uh, in recent history. Um, but again, most of them are a family member or a relative of uh, a revolutionary leader or an independence fighter or some other uh, significant personality uh, in, in these countries' histories. And it's, it's very rare that a woman who is not connected through a family um, uh, you know, political relationship um, is independently elected. And I think in Taiwan, we, we did achieve that. And I think that was a second turning point in terms of encouraging all the other women who are, are from just any, any kind of family or any background, um, you know, saying that there is room, you, you know, you, 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 you can make it, um, you know, there is that possibility and I, I think it was in, inspiration uh, for many others. Um, I, I think a third point is, you know, arriving at a stage of even, you know, broader um, inclusion and diversity. And, and it would have probably been the um, LGBT uh, movement. And, and, you know, in my opening remarks, I, I mentioned, you know, my role in 2006 in first raising this issue. I mean, and it took us 13 years. <laughs> through a very difficult process, including 
you know, different social and political organizations against it, you know, a lot of backlash, uh, misunderstanding, disinformation, fake news, and, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with this as, you know, in a broader context of Taiwan's democratization, but also specifically on all of the worst prejudices and, um, you know, views that you can imagine uh, on, on this issue. And so it took a lot of uh, political determination to withstand that backlash and, um, you know, counter mobilization. But I, I do have to give credit to a number of enlightened men, um, straight men, and many, of course, straight women, including women involved in these other uh, women NGOs uh, who, who were supportive. So it wasn't just the LGBT community. It was, you know, the broader um, um, political circle of, you know, people who recognized the need to respect diversity. Um, our, our prime minister, our premier, who is a man of uh, over 70 years old, um, came out and filmed a, a video in different native languages uh, communicating with the grassroots society on the need to support legislation um, uh, respecting the marriage equality right of the LGBT community. And, and, and I think, you know, it's important to build alliances. You know, while we recognize the need to put women in these positions of visibility and, and power. We also need to uh, be supportive and encouraging of those men who are also um, open, enlightened, and supportive of, of, of women's participation and, and willing to, to share that political power and that political space uh, with women. And, and so I think this is a process of broader social um, enlightenment and broader social reconciliation uh, as we make uh, progress in society. So um, I, I think these are all important inflection points in our in 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 our 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 progress um, in advancing uh, basic rights in our society. But it, it is an all-out society effort. Um, it does require um, you know different elements and and different. Uh, angles and perspectives, and of course, the involvement of all types of people in society to make it happen. Thank you. Following up to your point on sort of the familial backgrounds being a driver for women's participation, I loved how uh, in uh, Juhi Marchikau's in her video, she opens with an anecdote saying that you know her grandfather told her that he hates politicians and he hates journalists, and you know that's what she became. So I think that goes to your point that, you know, you, you see in Taiwan, it's, it's, it's not, um, you know, family um, history um, as the, the, the needed um, role to get into politics. Um, but sort of following oh, up- I, I wanna quickly respond to that point because I think a lot of the older generation, they discourage political participation because they are of the martial law um, um, error. And for, for the older generation, politics is dangerous. I mean, it's dirty. It's not a place for um, smart young women. And, and that's why that's one reason why they discourage it. But um, I, I think with, you know, building up, you know, our numbers and and crossing thresholds that also, um, you know, sets some positive examples of for for more more young women. I, I know a lot of my constituents would um, male constituents in the past would encourage me and say, you know, it's great you're doing what you're doing, but then they'd go home and tell their daughters, don't go into politics, it's dangerous, and, you know, we want to keep you safe. So I think it's important to to really overcome that, that um, you know, dictatorship and authoritarian legacy that continues to instill some sense of uh, fear in the older generation to to, to overcome things. But uh, of course, we are making progress, but in a broader Asian context, you know, this is still something um, of significance. And as we look at other closed societies, authoritarian societies, where you have random disappearances or imprisonments, um, you know, even, you know, political exile and where there is true danger in um political participation. I think we need to take that into consideration uh, as we develop a narrative that encourages more women. 
Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, following up to what you said at the end of your of your last um, remarks um, on sort of the role of men, Sandra, I want to turn it to you. Um, you know, the videos again focus on women's roles in in their participation in politics. But can you speak, um, following up to Ambassador Xiao's comments on sort of men's role in ensuring that women are able to experience equal representation and sort of you know, recent trends or, uh, you know, highlights you've seen in, in other um, in other um, countries. Thanks, Maven. I, I think, you know, again, uh, Taiwan is such a great example because it, uh, there are, I think, um, over 100 countries now with um, some kind of quota system, the reserve sea system that Ambassador Beacon uh, talked about. Uh, and, and you know that um, less than 50% of them actually even make or meet their numerical target. Um, uh, and we've um, never had a quota system that has been sunsetted, which is interesting because the whole point is that they were supposed to catalyze a change that did exactly what uh, Ambassador Beacon talked about, which was allowed women to participate in their own right in the competitive areas as well. Um, so this business about the whole society approach, and Ambassador, you, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, better is is exactly what we're talking about now and i think you know once you have you know provided support to women to be able to participate in their individual capacity once you have um worked on institutions and allowed them uh to uh reform and become more inclusive in their in their articles in their practices in their culture then you do have to change the minds usually of the society uh, and um, uh, present them with a different perspective on women's leadership. And I think that that's really where um, men can come in because they're, they're usually um, the uh, the leadership of, for example, the media. And, you know, um, to the point that, um, uh, I think, Lynn, your, your, your all-male panel, I bet if you went to the organizers of that all-male panel and said, why weren't there any women on there? They would say, oh, there aren't any women who are um, uh, available or women don't want to be here or, you know, women haven't got the right qualifications to be here or famously these days, women talk too much and meetings go too long. I think that was something said by somebody in your region recently, too. So, you know, there's a way in which uh, societies are in a way um, pre <laughs> pre pre uh, programmed to um, dismiss and uh, minimize women's leadership. And so that business about changing societal minds is hugely important because if you don't, what happens is, for example, you don't meet your quota. Um, and in some places, again, in the region, I think it's very interesting because Taiwan's at one end, uh, but you know, you have um, some stark examples of what happens in the region at the other end. Um, if you don't, the, the, the quota becomes a ceiling as opposed to a springboard. So women are kept to participation in the reserved seats. Um, uh, and you have situations where you have had long periods of women's leadership. I mean, in a certain country in the region, a very long period of two women's leadership that has not fundamentally shifted some of the gender issues around the, uh, the general populations. Um, and I think, you know, uh, um, as Ambassador B. Kim was talking, I remembered somebody um, from the Philippines, I have to say, the, the country out loud, he once said to me, Sandra, uh, we don't have um, a trickle down problem here in terms of women's leadership. We have a trickle up problem because it reflected exactly what Ambassador B. Kim said, that a lot of the women came from traditional families, uh, uh, traditional leadership families. They were the widows of or the wives of or whatever. Um, and so that is um, uh, the, the level at which women entered was at that level. And uh, a lot of the women who uh, were in civil society and did their um, apprenticeship, if you like, in civil society just never got, got up there. So he called it a trickle up problem, not a trickle down problem. Thanks, Andrew. Uh Lynn, I have a question for you. So you oversee programs across the Asia region. Um, so what would you like women and men in some of the other countries that you work in to learn from women like uh, Mia Boya, Xu Chiaoxing, um, Chihin Martikao, and Lai Pingyu? 
Um, thanks. So before I answer that, Sandra, you're absolutely right. I did reach out to the panel coordinator to see why there was no women. And he said he looked really hard, but could not find a qualified female speaker to be on the panel. And I said, I have at least 10 names. Next time, please. me. So that that's, that's unfortunately the reality that we still deal with, um, um, I guess, across, across the world. But um, sort of going back to um, Maeve, Maeve's question, these, so when, when I saw the videos, um, you know, there's a, there was a women's rights issues, but then um, there are also LGBTQ, um, women, youth and indigenous communities. These are very cross-cutting issues across the region that different um, democracy and human rights activists are dealing with. And um, and I understand that Taiwan still um, is struggling, but has made a lot of progress compared to any other countries in the region. And um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I think Taiwan could really uh, be an inspiration to these activists who are trying to figure out um, how to continue their struggles because um, the LGBT issues are very difficult um, and the indigenous community issues are really difficult. Um, and it, we're not just talking about indigenous community issues, um, we're talking about like Rohingya issues or, or Uyghurs in East Turkestan. So there are like ethnic minority issues where I think um, the Taiwan or the Taiwanese activists could sort of take additional steps in supporting these efforts in the region um, because um, these are sensitive issues, they're, they're geopolitically um, complicated, but at the same time, I think, um, and, and it doesn't have to be a, an issue that um, the Taiwanese government needs to pick up. I think Taiwanese civil society organizations, activists who understand the challenges they had to go through to be where they are now, if they can sort of serve as a source of inspiration and mentors um, to these um, leading um, activists in the region working on these similar issues, I think that would be fantastic, especially on the youth engagement part. Um, NDI and IRI and other organizations are both really um, bolstering um, your programs and youth because of that is that new generation. And as Ambassador Shah said, a lot of these um, youth activists don't have the, the previous baggage or historical um, legacy that their parents or grandparents have to deal with. So they're sort of entering into this political realm um, with like almost a clean slate. So how do we help them um, articulate and find their footing um, in the political realm in a way that the Taiwanese youth activists or young politicians have been able to do, I think that would also be a great contribution. So I wanna, uh, you know, you, you talked a lot about um, sort of Taiwan when, in your remarks about Taiwan's um, sort of experiences with um, indigenous communities and, um, ethnic minorities, and I think it'd be interesting, um, Ambassador Xiao, if you could talk, because I again, think that is something that Taiwan has, again, sort of been a leader on in how to address, especially the past. Um, and, you know, Taiwan, as we discussed, has a past of martial law, and there was obviously a lot of, you know, victims in, in, in there who were part of indigenous communities. Um, so could you talk a bit about how Taiwan has, um, you know, recently addressed those issues? Well, the um, indigenous rights movement um, grew also out of the post-martial law um, period and again, hand in hand with the broader democracy movement. Um, you know, a, a lot of people don't know this, but in Taiwan, there are 16 um, re recognized indigenous communities uh, that have their um, independent language and, and culture and um, heritage. Um, there were many more in the past, but unfortunately, as um, you know, history progressed, um, we, we've lost some of the cultures. And so it, it has become a priority of the government to provide the resources for sustaining the survival of uh, these um, indigenous cultures uh, in our society. Um, a lot of that includes uh, language, mother tongue, language um, education, but also uh, instilling a greater, you know, stronger identity um, in the um, you know, self-confidence of the younger generation uh, in their heritage and, and in that identity. 
Um, part of it also involves um, what we call a name rec re rectification, and that is uh, many of them throughout the colonial history, as well as the um, Han um, dominant uh, governance in Taiwan, you know, even lost their original names. And so, so we're encouraging indigenous people to adopt their um, uh, native uh, language name because that is fundamental to an identity and to recognition of who one is. And um, so there are many multiple policies uh, in place to encourage um, indigenous um, um, kind of revival of indigenous culture and, and identity. But, you know, all of this couldn't have happened without a strong indigenous movement itself that, again, grew out of um, the post martial law space and um, involved land rights, some um, cultural rights, uh, language rights, and uh, multiple rights, and uh, also recognition of um, um, the, the modern democratic governments that um, indigenous culture is an important part of the broader uh, Taiwan identity. And, and I, I think that is the same thing, you know, it, it's the same logic for, for women's participation. And that is, um, you know, you don't have a broader modern Taiwan identity unless everyone is included. And um, we're building a modern identity and, and we need to be, be, be mindful of that. Um, but I, I do want to um, say as we're approaching the end of this discussion that, um, you know, one re continuing challenge is um, Chinese coercion. And, you know, every time we try to do something, you know, from the first democratic election for president that we had until now, you know, every, you know, progress towards democracy, you know, we face, you know, the kind of coercion that's unimaginable for some other societies. But um, I, I think this um, coercion is now spreading. Um, for Taiwan, we have faced decades of this, but I think some other societies are now facing um, similar um, coercive efforts from the totalitarian um, regime in, in China and the utilization of tools of technology to um, suppress freedom of expression and to control uh, societal views is, is, is a very um, difficult challenge. And as Taiwan is in it, um, I think it's important that NDI and as you know, Lynn just talked about the need to share our experiences. And I think the cooperation and presence of NDI in Taiwan does exactly that. You know, it provides a platform for linking Taiwan's experiences with um, other um, emerging democracies or other struggling um, democracy movements, other struggling, um, you know, NGOs, women's groups, um, civil society organizations, um, you know, to, to just kind of be a mutually encouraging and reinforcing platform for sharing successes, success stories, and, and best practices on how to overcome those challenges. Because I think, you know, ultimately as a region, uh, we're in it together, and, and it is important that those networks and platforms exist. And, you know, Taiwan has been marginalized from um, international institutions, uh, like the United Nations, um, you know, ECOSOC, and you know, even CEDAW, um, the the covenant for eliminating um, all kinds of discrimination against women. You know, Taiwan wanted to be to ratify it, but we're prevented um, even from being part of that global uh, initiative. And so we had to do our own, you know, domestic ratification process that's not recognized at all internationally. So, you know, in, in, you know, facing all odds, you know, we still need the, the, the energy, the, the resources, the power to be resilient. And so I think international support for Taiwan throughout this entire process has been critical in sustaining a degree of confidence in where we are going. And, and I think that is important for other struggling societies as well. You know, if Taiwan can do it, I'm sure others can. And, you know, we're, we're, we're not at the end of the tunnel. You know, we are still in a, a, a formidable struggle, you know, uh, against um, especially external coercion uh, from, from the Chinese government. And um, I, I think there's a lot that we can, can gain from, you know, sharing and working uh, with other um, democratic movements in the region. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, as we've discussed um, in, in today's event, right, the, the impressive progress that Taiwan has made um, in its democratic development, which, you know, is laudable on its own. And then, as you mentioned, Ambassador Xiao, that it's especially so given um, sort of the, the threat that is constantly bearing down um, on, on Taiwan um, in, the, in the shape of, of, of China and the authoritarian influence that um, and is it is putting um, on on Taiwan and and its people. So um, I don't want you know we're we're sort of at the end of time, but I did you know if Sandra Lynn, do you have remarks that you wanted to make before I I close up? Well, I just wanted to to again you know stress two things. First of all, you know the the, the moment of transition, the moment of political transition. We call it a moment, but as has been demonstrated, um, it is decades long. Uh, and we have to be in it for the long haul. Uh, and I think that that's something, again, um, that Taiwan could share with others. It, it's, it's decades. Um, Ambassador B. Kim talked about 13 years on the Equal Marriage Act, for example. So it's a decade long, decades long uh, issue. Um, and I, I do just want to re-quote re uh, Mia Boya, um, because again, some, some really um, moving uh, uh, statements he made. One uh, was that, um, the fact that we can open a flower like this in such a narrow gap and persevere is amazing. And of course, he was talking about Taiwan. Uh, and I do think um, that um, we, we all must salute Taiwan for what it's um, uh, doing and attempting to do and striving to do uh, in democratic uh, consolidation. And um, I, I look forward to the opportunity to um, uh, engaging more uh, with, with uh, Taiwan and the Taiwan Forum for Democracy. Um, and doing much more of that um, exchange and, uh, and cross lesson learning uh, with other groups in other parts of the world. Thank you for having me on today, Maeve. Um, for me, just briefly, um, I am, we're looking forward to NDI's um, East Asia Democracy Unity Project, which will include um, a strategy for um, working with Taiwan to elevate Taiwan's role in um, supporting democracy and building democratic unity in the region. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And Ambassador Xiao, as we mentioned to you before, the NED family um, that includes NDI, IRI, Solidarity Center, and SAIP, we're all committed to working with Taiwan um, to continue to work on um, these issues, not just on the China's a malign influence. I mean, it's really important, and that's where Taiwan can take um, global leadership and um, supporting others to um, deal with China's influence in the way that Taiwan has been able to do so. But we really would like to see Taiwan to be a pro-democracy player, the supporter of democracy movements around the world. In terms of what that's going to look like, it's to be seen, but we're looking forward to um, working with Taiwan, particularly TFD on this front. So just wanted to reemphasize that. Thank you, Lynn and Sandra. And Again, just to reiterate, um, as I mentioned on top, I am currently in Taipei. Um, I'm here because NDI is opening an office, and so I'm sort of helping with that process. So this is really, you know, just the beginning for NDI in our work in Taiwan, and we are really excited um, about all the work that's ahead of us. But you know, the you know fantastic partnerships and collaborations um, as well. So. With that, I will wrap things up. Thank you so much again, Ambassador Xiao, Sandra, and Lynn for joining us um, this morning and for everyone else who watched. Um, again, if you haven't watched the Faces of Democracy Taiwan videos, please do. They're great. They're about five minutes each, so they're not too long. Um, and um, they're incredible stories of, of incredible women. So have a good rest of your day, everybody. <laughs>